All right, if you would please take your copy of the scriptures this morning and turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Excited about moving through the next portion of Acts. I was talking to Katie yesterday, uh, talking about how the past couple weeks have been relatively difficult with regard to preparing messages. It's just been a little difficult to, to because it's so repetitive <laughs> in the sense of here's, you know, Paul again, and he's still in trouble and he's still in prison. And he's still appearing before yet another person in order to give testimony of these things. This context that began several chapters ago, all the way back to whenever Paul was initially uh, arrested and then she reminded me wonderfully of, well, when things are repeated in the scripture, it means that they're important. And so we need to pay attention to those things. And so what we're going to see this morning as Paul is before Agrippa, uh, that he is going to give his testimony for the third time in, in the book of Acts. Uh, how, how, and I think that it's important for us to remember some of the things that he mentions while he's given his testimony. Uh, by way of contextual reminder uh, Paul is in prison still he's still in it's sort of a lighthouse arrest but he's still in prison he's still in chains and he's appearing in chains before this governor by the name of Festus who is a Roman pagan governor and then he's also appearing before Agrippa who is the king of a region nearby who is living with his incestuous sister wife relationship thing going on he's a reprobate of a king King, um, and a pagan governor, and Paul finds himself with the privilege of being able to present himself uh, and give testimony to Christ in the midst of all of that. And I want us to pay special attention to Paul's attitude during this entire time this morning as we think about this. That how would you respond? How might I respond if we had been imprisoned for more than two years for crimes against us that were unjust to begin with? And given the opportunity, now we have to answer for ourselves in front of these godless pagan people. And I think about that, and I think about that, may I have the same mindset that Paul had during this time, which is, what a privilege! What a privilege that I have! Like, imagine this. Imagine you, you were arrested for whatever reason, and you found yourself uh, standing before the governor of Missouri. Now, the governor of Missouri is not that bad. He's pretty decent with regard to governors. But what I'm saying, though, is that imagine you were, I don't know, in another state, California, and, and you had to stand before that guy. And you had to give your testimony in front of this person. And you had opportunity between in front of that person and a whole fanfare of people all in that room, none of them believers all of them living not just as unbelievers, but as really highly, strongly opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are the appointed person of God to be able to stand before them and then proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ. You get the privilege of being able, in that position, to be able to declare Christ. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had dreams about opportunities like that. How awesome it would be. Well, if I were to maybe able to go up to Washington, D.C., and if I could preach to those guys, you know. You know, think about those things that you've maybe thought in your mind. Maybe it's just me. I'm a weirdo like that. I understand. I'm wearing a Wookiee shirt today, okay? I get that it's weird. But what I'm saying is that imagine that opportunity. Imagine the, the privilege of you giving audience to the rulers of your land, so to speak, and then you get the opportunity to preach Jesus to them. I think about uh, Billy Graham. You know, he's got his ups and his downs and his good things and his bad things about him. But one of the things he never did was shirk his responsibility to proclaim the gospel everywhere that he went. And he had opportunity to preach to presidents. He had the opportunity to preach to world uh, rulers and leaders to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think about this. Now, Paul, I'm sure, did not hope to be in 
prison. I'm sure he did not wish to be in chains. I guarantee you he didn't want to be falsely accused and under house arrest for the past two years. But in the providence of God, that was the means by which God orchestrated all of these things so that way Paul would have the privilege of being able to proclaim Jesus Christ to Festus and to Agrippa and to Bernice. So stand with me this morning as we read through this passage of Scripture and hear about what Paul is going to say to these rulers, these dignitaries. Verse 1 of chapter 26, it says this, So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate. Let those words just sink in for a moment. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, religion I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of the hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship day and night. Night and day, that's what it actually says. Um, and for this hope I am accused by Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." In this, connection, I, uh, in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority of the commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who, uh, and those who journeyed with me. And when he had, we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, or the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not a disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, and then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying to both, both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim both, uh, light both to our people and to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord, given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned for us by Luke, the servant of God. Receive this word with the weight that it carries, because this is the word of God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would please bless the proclamation of your word this morning. 
I pray, God, that as I proclaim your word, I would not do violence or damage uh, or treat your text in any disingenuous fashion at all, Lord, but I would proclaim it faithfully and truthfully, Lord. We pray that you would move in our midst, convicting us all of righteousness and sin and judgment, Lord. And we pray that your words would go forth, Lord, and not return unto you void. We pray, Father, that this time would be yours and that you would, you would glorify yourself through the proclamation of your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul's defense before Agrippa, I don't know what else to call it except for just another, the third time, or maybe even to say Paul's third declaration of his testimony, or Paul tells of his conversion for a third time, or something along those lines, because that's really the crux of all that's happening here. And in doing so, Paul is giving more than just a testimony. He's giving opportunity for these people to uh, believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and therefore, by repentance, find faith in his name because even in the midst of his persecution even in the midst of being unjustly locked up even in the midst of his being treated unfairly unjustly and having false accusations brought against him Paul did not wallow in those things he did not sit and, and soak and sour in, in the fact that he was uh, treated unjustly, that he was treated unfairly. But he only looked for the next opportunity he had in order to proclaim Jesus Christ and to proclaim him faithfully. And so that's what we find Paul doing yet again. Uh, remember that Paul has been in prison, that Festus, who's the governor, has, has brought this guy Agrippa, who is the king in the area there, with his sister wife, uh, uh, Bernice, in with him because Agrippa is a person who's known as somebody who knew the customs and, and all the rules of the Jews. Because Paul uh, is sitting in prison, having been handed over from Felix to Festus, and under Festus, Paul appeals to Caesar, and still Festus is like, well, he appealed to Caesar, I need to send him to Caesar, but I still don't know what's going on. I don't understand why I even have Paul in prison. As we found out last time, he said, if it was something like he was an insurrectionist or he was a thief or he was a murderer or something along those lines, I might have something to say, but I don't. All I can tell is that there's some sort of a dispute amongst the Jews and Paul because of some religious thing that's going on. So he brings Agrippa in because Agrippa is a sort of uh, um, an experienced person with discerning the law and discerning the manner and the customs of the Jews. So he brings him in in order to give a hearing so that Paul may give a defense. And so that's where we find ourselves. Paul is going to answer in defense for the third time before the third different ruler in order actually a couple of different rulers now and give a defense of himself before them so that's where it says so agrippa said to paul you have permission to speak for yourself so then paul stretched out his hand and made his defense now what we don't see in actually our entire passage today but what we're going to find out is that paul is in chains so when he's lifting up his hand to give a defense, there's likely a chain attached to that. So he is gleefully and joyfully uh, uh, proclaiming his bondage because of how happy he is that he is inbound in order to, in order to proclaim this wonderful privilege uh, uh, of, of proclaiming Christ to them. He's, he's almost glorying in his infirmity, in his humility, in his being brought very low. We know that's just like Paul. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, he talks about the thorn in the flesh that was given to him, that he prayed three times that the Lord might remove, but he didn't. Instead, God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is perfected in your weakness. And so Paul says, I will boast all the more in my weakness that Christ's strength may be made perfect in me. And so I think we see this, Paul, that Paul, when he's raising his hand here, it's not to silence a crowd like he did several chapters before. But this was like in the manner of a Greek orator. This is him. He's going to proclaim something now. And so he's raising his hand. But in doing so, he's, he's exalting his bondage. He's exalting his chains. And he says the next phrase so amazingly, I consider myself fortunate. 
Now, this word fortunate is translated a different way when we read it in this, as the same word that Jesus uses when he's giving the Beatitudes. The word is makarias. I always remembered it as, hey, makarias. That's how I remembered it in Greek whenever I learned that. And that was a Greek word that will always stand out as one I don't have to look up the definition for because I have that stupid mnemonic device. That's neither here nor there, but it's just fun. Uh, but the word means happy or even blessed. Like I said, this is the same word that Jesus uses when he proclaims the Beatitudes. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you whenever they revile and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. It's the same word. Paul says, I consider myself fortunate. I consider myself happy. I consider myself blessed. Blessed. Is that something that we could say if we find our, found ourselves in a similar situation? Would we look at ourselves having been unjustly condemned, unjustly imprisoned, unjustly bound in chains and say, man, I'm so blessed. It's a reminder, isn't it, of the fact that even in the difficult times of life, even in the trials and the difficulties and the strains in life that we go through, that we, being found in Christ, continue to be blessed. Because even if Paul didn't have this privilege, but he was locked in a dungeon and forgotten, he would still be blessed because it's still much better than he deserved, which is the wrath and the vengeance of God. Because as, as being counted as, as, as a person having their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we are blessed regardless of the temporal circumstances in which we find ourselves. Now, I know that for like the third or fourth straight week, I've said something similar. But do you think that God's trying to get our attention with something here? To remind ourselves that even in the midst of trial and difficulty and great turmoil and all of the things in which we might experience, that we are still very blessed. Blessed and highly favored, exceedingly uh, 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 exalted because of who we are in Christ. And ultimately, it's all because of who He is and the favor and the grace that He has bestowed upon us. That even in the midst of, of the great trials and tribulations and, and, and things that come upon us that have a great, wonderful way of divorcing us from the temporal pleasures of this life and reminding us of something that's far greater, a much, a, a much weightier bedrock on which we stand, and that is being found in Christ Jesus. That sometimes when you have nothing else, you realize that God is all you ever needed to begin with. That if, when you find out that God is enough, then you know that, that it doesn't matter what any, or anything else you know, that comes our way. That God is enough in all the circumstances. So he says, I find myself fortunate. But God, he's not just fortunate because his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, though he is fortunate for that. He, he considers himself blessed and happy because he gets to stand before a king and proclaim again how Jesus changed his stinking life. That here he was, a man who was dead set on persecuting the way, dead set on opposing Christ until Christ got a hold of him and changed his life. And so he gets to proclaim that again, to declare that again, the excellencies of Christ. So he says, I'm going to make my defense today against you, uh, 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 excuse me, against all the accusations of the Jews. So here we go. Especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. He says, I, he's, he's affording Agrippa the honor that is due his office. 
Folks, we had a wonderful time of discussion this morning in our Bible study time, talking about the role of civil government for Romans 13, and, and, and talking about showing respect to the offices that are there. Now, Agrippa is a reprobate. He's an absolute godless man who hates Jesus and hates God and, and wants to fulfill all his own passions and desires and all of these things. But he's still the king, regardless of whether you like him or not. So we have been called as people um, who are followers of Christ to submit and respect the offices of governing authorities that sit over us. We're not called to be lawless people. We're supposed to pay the respect and honor due to the office. Not the man, necessarily, but the office. And so that's what Paul is doing here. So he is showing himself respectful before the king. Do you think that Agrippa would have listened to any other words that he had to say if Paul immediately said, I don't know why you're king, you godless reprobate. Why don't you stop sleeping with your sister and all these things like that? No, he starts by giving uh, the respect that's due to him. Okay, And it's good to do those things, to not let our personal vendettas get in the way of what God has commanded us to be and how we're supposed to address people and stand before them. So he says this, my manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning amongst my own nation in, in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. In other words, Paul says, look, I'm not some obscure guy from backwater wherever. I'm Saul of Tarsus here, who has been, whose name's been transformed into Paul, but I'm the, everybody knows who I am. We're going to find out in a few minutes that most likely there's an indication here that he actually sat on the Sanhedrin at one point in time. Okay? So this is known. He's known. He's saying, I'm not obscure here, Agrippa. I'm not some no-name, weird, insurrectionist, vigilante guy. I'm Saul of Tarsus, who have been following the customs and the laws of the Jews for my entire life. I've always been in, 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 a, in a mind and a heart to, to seek the Lord and to obey Him by keeping the law. And he says, I've kept all of these things, and I'm known for doing these things. Now, Saul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And in fact, the very reason why he's the one sent out by the chief priests to go and arrest these people is testimony of that. He had a reputation of being zealous for the law. He had a reputation of being a person who was on fire, you know, for Judaism, so to speak. Okay? All of us come from some sort of reputation, don't we? We all have a used to be. Some of us came to faith in Christ at an early age. Praise God for that. Praise God that you used to be is I used to be a kid who fought with my brothers and sisters over toys and disobeyed my parents from time to time. But Jesus got a hold of me and saved me. Praise God if you've got that testimony. I don't have that testimony. I've got a different kind of used to be testimony. My used to be testimony was I was running headlong for hell and in total rebellion against God and man and my parents and everything. And I was just a reprobate of a man committing all sex, sorts of, of immoralities and lusts and passions of the flesh and all of these things running against God and God changed my life. Okay, so Paul has this testimony though. His testimony was, I was a religious nut. And I was passionate about my religion, you see. But he was passionate in the wrong way, going the wrong direction. Which, once again, I've said before, but here it is the third time, so I'll say it again. It must be important that you can be passionate for something and be passionately wrong about that pursuit. Now, when we say faith, we're not talking about faith for faith's sake. You don't just believe in something. Paul believed in something, and he believed in it fervently, you see. There are many Muslims around the world that are very passionate about their faith, to the point where they'll blow themselves up in order to, to uh, 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 demonstrate their passion and their devotion to their faith. I mean, don't think that the passion and the zeal is not there. It's there, but it's misdirected. It's anti-Christ and anti-God. And so Paul found himself in his passion not 
not fulfilling the commands of God, but actually opposing the commands of God because he missed the very person whom God was separating and setting out to, to, to position as the Messiah, and that's Christ Jesus. It was all leading to Christ, but Paul was anti-Christ. And so in verse 5 it says, They have known for a long time, and if, if they are willing to testify, I love that little jab, if they were here to testify about these things, they might tell you these things, but they're not, um, is known by all the Jews. Sorry, sorry. Uh, that, they are, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial. Why? Because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers. What in the world is that promise? Well, I think based upon the context and what Paul's about to say here, it's the resurrection. The promise is the resurrection. And the promise of the covenant also that leads to the re resurrection, so to speak, given to Abraham, that, that which began through him. Remember how Paul uses um, that, that wonderful symbolic language to talk about the son of the promise who by, by a, as a type and a shadow of the resurrection of the, uh, to come, that Isaac, who was good as dead on the mountain, was received back to him alive. And he uses that to illustrate the type and the shadow pointing forward to the resurrection that is to come. That if you read in the book of Job, in Job chapter 19, that even before Abraham, or at least potentially maybe a contemporary of Abraham, the oldest written scriptures of the Bible, how Job says in Job 19, that he knows that his Redeemer lives, and in his flesh he shall see God. How he proclaimed even before the law came of the resurrection that was to come. How in Psalm 19, 11, how it said that God would not leave his Holy One in Sheol, nor let his, his Holy One see corruption. That there was a resurrection that was prophesied. That passage from Isaiah talks about from the ground they're going to come up. And Ezekiel from the valley of dry bones that they're going to come up, they're going to be raised. It's all a foreshadow, a taste of the looking forward to the resurrection that is to come. And this is the hope that Paul has. And this is his driving factor that this hope of resurrection is not found by keeping the law. It's not found by cold, dead religion. It's found by faith in Jesus Christ and in that alone. And so he's going to illustrate that here. He says, he says, uh, um, Keep losing my place, I apologize. Um, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and or night and day. And for this hope I am accused, O King. I have hope in the resurrection. So verse 8, so in case you didn't realize that's what he was talking about, he says it. So why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Okay? They're all hoping for it. In fact, they're hoping, but their hope is misguided. Look at what they're hoping in. They're going through the temple sacrifices. They're trying to keep the law. They're trying to perform all these customs and thinking that all of those things are what make you righteous before God. But by the works of the flesh, no flesh shall be justified. That justification doesn't come by the works of the flesh. Justification doesn't even come through the sacrificial system. Justification doesn't come by keeping the law. The justification that saves is the justification that is by faith alone. And that faith alone that puts its faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Christ alone saves. Christ alone is the hope of our resurrection. So what he's saying is, is that what I'm believing in is not separate from what they're doing, but all of that points to Christ. All of that points to where I place my faith and trust. All of that points to the fact that Jesus Christ came to be that sacrifice, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, we may attain the hope of the resurrection through faith in Jesus Christ. So do you think it's too hard for God to raise the dead? I like how he says that. Why do you think it's incredible that, uh, that God raises from the dead? If he created all things, do you think he could also bring to life that which was dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, 
But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. That's the illusion here that, may, that many scholars think that this is the reason why they think Paul may have sat on the Sanhedrin. That he is sitting on that council and he is casting his votes. That when people are being dragged before the Sanhedrin, Paul's there with them and he's casting his vote against them. Okay? So here he is opposing Christ. In the name of religion, in the name of Judaism, he's opposing Christ. There is hope in nothing else but Jesus Christ. And I pray for my Jewish brothers and sisters because they are still lost, opposing Christ. That whether Jew or Greek, no matter what nation you're a part of, Salvation is through no one else except for Jesus Christ. Verse 11, I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Isn't that amazing? You guys remember reading back? In the early days of Paul's missionary journeys, how he would go to this synagogue until they kicked him out in the city and he'd go down to this city. But then you found out that the Jewish leadership from the synagogue here at this city, they would actually go like a hundred miles to then go oppose him here over in this city. That was what Paul did ended up happening to him in that same way. Isn't that just wild to think about that? That wasn't anything new for them to do that. They were so antagonistic to Christ. They were so against Christ that they would, they would travel to foreign lands or foreign cities just to oppose Christ there as Paul himself did. See, I was among them. I thought it was, I was doing God's work by opposing Christ in all of these places. So, while I was on my way to do that, Paul was not on his way to do anything else except for to continue opposing Christ. With the authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I just love this so much. It's worth repeating this as well. Not only does Christ speak to him, he speaks to him in the Hebrew language. I think that's really the, the intimacy and the beauty of, of just the thought that he speaks to Paul where he is. Okay? And then he calls out his name twice. Saul, Saul. In the same way that David cries out, O oh, Absalom, Absalom. Oh, when God cries out, Moses, Moses. That's an endearing way. It's an enticing way. It, it's, it's a drawing thing. It means that Christ is not coming to get, come against Paul in judgment here. But he's come against him to draw him to himself. If Christ can literally save the man who is on his way to continue opposing and, and, and terrorizing him, do you think that he can save anyone in this room or anyone else in this world? I just love this so much that Paul is absolutely like in his, in his foolishness, in his obstinance, in his passion, he's opposing Christ. And Christ just basically says, knock it off. <laughs> Come follow me now. You're going to follow me now. You're going to stop doing this. You're going to follow me now. I love how he says it's hard for him to kick against the goads. The idea a goad is, is, is you know, a, a way to lead sheep. And, and here, here's Jesus trying to lead his sheep. And he's like, Paul, you're resisting me. Paul, you're resisting me. And finally, it's just almost like, whack, knock it off. <laughs> you know, you're going to follow me now. Um, do you know like, what I love about this here? Um, Oh, well, let's just continue for a second here. He says, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which you, I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among whom you are sanctified by faith in me. Question. Was there a question in any of that? Did Jesus said, Paul, would you like to follow me and go to these places and go do this thing? <laughs> Was there an invitation given there at all? No, there wasn't. Just a command. You're mine now, and this is what you're going to go do. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand. Though we proclaim Jesus, and though we do invite people to place their faith and trust in Christ, we do. We, 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 we invite them to do so. But the fact of the matter is, is that Christ Jesus is the Lord. He is the Lord. And He's the Lord whether you would follow Him or not. Whether, and I guess in a way, Paul um, could have been disobedient, but he would have been disobedient to the command of God, not to the invitation of God, you see. I think in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul himself mentions when he's on the Areopagus, he says, um, you know, God's overlooked all these past times of disobedience, but now he has commanded everywhere to repent. Everyone, everywhere to repent and place their faith and trust in Christ Jesus as Lord, to surrender to him as Lord. Because here's the deal. When we, when we refuse to do so, we're not just neglecting an invitation that's been given to us. We're disobedient to a command that has been commanded to us, you see. That Christ commands us to repent. Christ, who is the Lord. And Paul recognizes this here. And Jesus presents himself this way, you see. That if you also were to then go to the book of Revelation, especially if you just read in chapter 1, how when, when Christ appears to John, he doesn't appear to him as this meek, humble servant, you see. But he appears to John as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's clothed with glory, with all manner of beauty and radiance and power and majesty about him. Why? Because he is the Lord. And we either obey him, or we disobey him. But there's no middle ground that Christ Jesus is the Lord. He is the king. And as he commands, we do. Or we're disobedient to him in rebellion and unrepentance. But praise God, Paul was obedient because I think he was given a new heart and a new, and a new spirit there. He was regenerated in that moment when Christ got a hold of him and changed his life. And it says that, that, that he immediately made him to be a servant. And that servant that he made him to be was one who was going to proclaim Jesus Christ to everywhere. And once again, I, always, I wish, I, you know, I, I always want to find like some middle ground of uh, uh, translations, you know. It's like I love the ESV a lot. And, and a lot of our modern translations have this rendered in many places where it says Gentiles. But it's not just Gentiles, it's the nations, I've called you to go to the nations and to proclaim to all the nations. Israel is one nation of many nations whom God has, you know, purchased for himself. We've been called to go disciple the nations, you see. And so he says to Paul, you're going to go to the nations and you proclaim the excellencies of Christ that they may receive forgiveness of sins, that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Notice all of these juxtapositions. It's, there's no neutral middle ground here. You're either in darkness or you're in light. You're under the power of Satan or God. You're either, you're either in sin or you've received forgiveness of sins. You see? There's no neutral ground. There's no middle place here. You're either of your father, the devil, as Jesus said to the Pharisees in opposition against him in John chapter 8, or you're mine. There is no middle ground. 
And so that's what Jesus says to him. You may proclaim the excellencies that they may turn, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And how do they receive that? How are they sanctified? By faith in me. Jesus himself says to Paul here, no other name, no other person. There's no other forgiveness out there except through Jesus Christ. And so he, you are to go to proclaim that, that they may repent and that they may find forgiveness, that they may turn from light or darkness to light, from Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's the same call for us today. It's the same thing for us. That you, you, even if you are, quote unquote, close to repentance or close to putting your faith in Christ, means you're all the way lost, you see? You're all the way lost. That you, unless you are placing your faith and trust in Christ and in Him alone, you have no forgiveness of sins. But in Christ, you are out of darkness and have been placed in the light. But in Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you receive eternal life. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life through Christ and through faith in Christ alone. Therefore, O King Agrippa, here he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He understood it was a command and he says, I was not disobedient. I, I, uh, I followed what Christ said for me. I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, then also to the nations that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. See, it doesn't mean that there isn't a change that does come with respect to that a person who has been transformed by the redeeming power of Christ does then produce fruits of that, of that righteousness, see, fruits of that salvation. But we're saved unto good works, not by good works, you see that we're justified by grace through faith and in Jesus Christ alone. And then that produces within us the works of righteousness, you see, just as it says in James chapter 2. For this reason, in other words, because I went around proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ and proclaiming Jesus Christ and Him alone, the Jews seized me in the temple and they tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. Do you hear that? <laughs> Oh, may I have the perspective of Paul. He looked at his imprisonment and all of these things, and he didn't say, he, he didn't say God, you messed up. You made a mistake. He said, oh, thank you. In the midst of all of this, I've had the help from God. Remember when Jesus appeared to him in the prison cell down in Jerusalem before he was escaped, and Jesus said to him, don't worry, I got you. Just as you, as you, as you uh, uh, proclaimed me here, you're also going to proclaim me all the way up in Rome. I'm sending you to Rome, Paul, just like you always hoped I would, but it's not the way you thought I would. And he did so, but it, what did we see? Paul still recognizes he's not dead in the middle of he's here proclaiming Christ to kings and governors. And he recognizes that Jesus is the one who protected him and allowed him to do these things. It's because of Christ and his providence and his kingship and his lordship put into practice, preserving him by his providential hand. Here he is before Agrippa, having been uh, preserved in the midst of all of this. And he recognizes that. It's a great reminder to us that we look to see how God has preserved us. How, how maybe what we, 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 we have such a, a way of always looking up rather than looking down, don't we? You know, in, in, in some ways with regard to money or status or possessions or things along those lines, we always look at the people who have more than us. We never stop and think about the people who are lowlier than us. We always think, why can't I be like that person instead of, God, thank you so much that you brought me out of this, you see? And, and, and I think that Paul is doing that here. He's, he's seen, yeah, maybe he's a prisoner. Yeah, he's in chains. But man, look at all the ways in which Christ preserved me. Did God preserve you from accidents 
on your way to church this morning in the rain? I don't know. He might have. Did God preserve you from, from falling off a ladder last week when you were hanging Christmas lights or whatever, you know? I don't know. He might have. You see what I'm saying? We look at the, the why, why, why come I don't feel very good today instead of thinking, wow, I don't have, you know, whatever right now. Fill in the blank. God's preserved me this far by his grace, by his providence, by, by, by his, his, his mercy toward you. You woke up this morning because of the mercy of God. You still have breath in your mouth and your lungs today because of the mercy of God. Your heart is still beating today because of the mercy of God. And praise God. I thank you. I, I've been preserved <laughs> this day. I've had the help that comes from God. Why? So that I may stand here testifying both of the small and the great saying nothing but what the prophets and, and Moses say would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim both our light both to our people and to the nations. I stand before you today because the kingdom of God continues to grow and prosper and expand. I stand before you today. We're all still here today because we still have work to do. We still have been, if you're here today, then you're here today so that the kingdom of God may continue to grow and flourish and expand. If you're here today, it's because the kingdom of God has you here today. That you may continue to do the work that he has placed before you. So let us not look to today in all the ways in which I can fulfill my own wants and desires and, and selfishnesses and things. But how through his grace given to me today, I may continue to proclaim his kingdom for his glory, for his namesake, that he may be all and all and exalted above all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being called your people, your servants, Lord. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, Lord. That we are a, a, a spiritual house being built together, Lord. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being here today still. And we are still here today because you're not done using us for your glory and for your kingdom. So help us to have that mindset, Lord, to always have in our minds thinking about your glory, your kingdom, your majesty and your name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> according to the first question, Lord, that, that the whole duty of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's a wonderful picture of how in doing that, Lord, there is joy. We thank you, Lord, that obeying you is both for the sake of your kingdom, but it also brings joy to us as well. That it is a joyful and good thing to do what brings you glory. Because it's good for us too. And in your mercy and in your grace, Lord, you have shown us that the ultimate joy that we can have is through worshiping you and proclaiming you. May we truly see that. May this Christmas season mean even more to us, Lord. Because we're in you. And may we be more joyful and more, more full of the wonder and the glory of this season because, because we know it's all about you. And then by doing that, by giving ourselves away, we are filled. Father, I pray for every person in this room that they would also be obedient to Christ and that they would recognize that Christ is Lord and that they would find salvation and that they would receive repentance and forgiveness of sins, Lord, through faith in Jesus Christ. That they would be transferred from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. So if there's some person in here who is not walking in obedience to Christ today, that they would repent. And they receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the hope of the resurrection. Father, as we now come to your table, we pray that we would come to with hearts um, joyful and eager to spend this time in fellowship with you at your table.
thank you, Father, that it's your broken body and your shed blood that we're celebrating this morning, Lord, which is our only means of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.